So when we were talking about the cell membrane, how it has a lipid bilayer, you can see here these are the hydrophilic heads and these are the hydrophobic tails. And you can also see how embedded inside of the cell membrane are different proteins. So you can see this one right here, it acts as a channel. Anything that can't get through the cell membrane by itself through diffusion actually travels through the little channel, kind of like a bridge. So any material that's lipid soluble can cross and any other metabolic materials, things needed for the cell to undergo its processes, has to use a protein to get across, either through active or passive transport. So there are four different ways for something to get across the cell membrane. It can either simply diffuse, which means that it's soluble in fat, or it uses a channel, or it uses facilitated diffusion, or it uses active transport. So the first thing we're going to talk about is diffusion. Diffusion is just when something goes from high concentration to low concentration. So if you put dye in some water and you had a selectively permeable membrane here, what you would notice is that the little molecules would make their way across the barrier and they would diffuse. So you'd go from having a high concentration here to having a little bit higher and a little bit higher concentration over here. So you go from high to low, that's where the molecules will go, so long as they can go through the membrane. At the bottom here you see purple on the left and orange on the right. The molecules on the right, they're going to diffuse and go left, and the molecules on the left are going to diffuse and go right, so long as they can go through the membrane. Osmosis is the selective diffusion of water. So it's diffusion, but it's only water, it's nothing else. So if you had a bucket here, and down the middle you had a membrane that was only permeable by water and we said that the water molecules are depicted by the black dots and we'll say that the orange molecules are sugar. So what happens is we have a high concentration of sugar on the left, we have a low concentration of sugar on the right. You would think that the sugar molecules would diffuse from left to right but the problem is that these molecules can't get through this membrane because the holes are too small. So what do you think is going to happen? Because all that could happen to even out the amount of sugar molecules is for the water molecules to cross through. If we look back here, if these orange sugar molecules can't go across to even themselves out, then the water is going to come from the right and go to the left to even out the amount of sugar. As it does that, the amount of water, the volume in side B, will cross over to side A. The volume in side A will go up. The volume on side B will go down. So in this video, you'll be able to see an example of how uh, diffusion occurs. So you can see here, there's yellow molecules. We're saying that it's a uh, maybe sugar molecules and it's suspended in water. And so you can see here how even though one molecule displaces another, they all pretty much stay evenly distributed. So if you start with uh, just a beaker of water and then you put a lump of sugar in it, as the sugar begins to dissolve, what happens is all the molecules go from one area to diffusing throughout the entire glass. So they go from an area of high concentration here, high concentration, and spread out to the other areas where there's no sugar molecules. So we call this a state of equilibrium where the sugar molecules are dispersed throughout. So once they're spaced out, it's not like they stop and don't move anymore. It's just that when one molecule moves, the other ones move to compensate and they still stay as spaced out as possible. Alright, so you should be able to explain to me what would happen if I gave you this picture. Okay, you say that because of osmosis and selectively permeable membranes like our cells, our cells can only let certain molecules go through them. Sugar wouldn't be one of them, but water is. So if this was like our cell membrane, sugar molecules wouldn't be able to go through, just the water would be able to go through. And so this water here would leave and go inside. That's what happens when we get dehydrated. Here we have various terms that talk about concentration, and they're all with regards to 
um, the concentration of a solute in a solution like water. So in the top picture, what you have here is a cell. The green represents the area outside of the cell, and the orange represents the area inside the cell. So if we say that the cell is in a hypotonic solution, what it means is that the solute is less on the outside than on the inside, less in concentration. So if we say that these little green molecules are salt, then the cell is in a hypotonic solution because the cell has more salt in it than its environment. So more molecules of salt inside, less outside, hypotonic. Isotonic is easy to remember. It means that there's the same amount of molecules on the outside in the environment as there is on the inside. That's a state of equilibrium. Hypertonic means that the cell has more solute outside of it than there is inside. So in this picture here, you see all these molecules of salt. Well, there's less inside. So what's probably going to happen is fluid or water from inside the cell is going to try to make its way out to decrease the concentration of the solute outside of it. And that's how you get dehydrated. So in animal cells, we all know that animal cells don't have cell walls. They just have cell membranes. So what happens is if you put an animal cell in a hypotonic solution, like this one, what's going to happen is you have a lot of water out here. Okay, You have a low concentration of solute. So say it's salt. You don't have much salt out here. You have lots of salt in here. To even out the concentration, water is going to make its way from the outside to the inside. Because when water comes in, it lowers the concentration of salt. So as the water moves in, the cell gets bigger and bigger. So what you see here, in that case, when all the water is rushing in to lower the concentration of salt, the cell eventually bursts because the cell membrane can't hold water anymore. In an isotonic solution, the cell stays normal. Okay, It has a certain amount of pressure inside of it, and so it maintains that pressure because whatever water comes in also ends up leaving. In a hypertonic solution, like we saw here, in the hypertonic solution, a cell would have a lot of solute outside of it. So all these salt molecules out here need to kind of be um, have added water to them. So the only way to get the water into them is to take water from the cell. So in an attempt to even out the concentration of salt outside of the cell, water from inside the cell leaves to try to dilute all the salt. And as water leaves the cell, the cell is going to start to shrink and shrivel. That's what happens here. So in a hypertonic solution, when the water leaves the cell, the cell shrivels. And that's what happens when we get dehydrated. The case is different in animals, though. Or, sorry, animals than in plants. So in plants, there's a cell wall. And that cell wall helps restrict a lot of the cell lysing and also a lot of the shriveling. So you don't see as dramatic of effects. So in animals, we saw the cell burst and shrivel. In plant cells, you're going to see the cell get turgid, okay, but it won't burst because the cell wall keeps it intact. And you'll see it plasma lyse, which is where the cell membrane contracts and gets tiny and shrivels, but the cell wall is still intact and the same, basically. So when the cell wall um, starts to bubble out, we call that turgid. That's like a well-watered plant. Um, this is a regular plant cell in an isotonic solution. And the plasmalized cell, this happens in the hypertonic, where if we look here, there's a lot of solute outside. Water wants to leave the cell to even out the concentration. And as water leaves the cell, the cell membrane is going to contract, but the cell wall doesn't because it's made of a more strong material. We call that plasmalized. So you can see here, this is a regular plant cell, and these are cells that have been plasmalized. The cell membrane has shrunken down. It no longer touches the outside cell wall. All right, so we can look at this animation here, and it explains how osmosis works. Remember, osmosis is the diffusion.
of water. So when we're specifically talking about water being diffused, that's osmosis. So you can see here, these are little water molecules. Okay, so this is the fluid that's here. The water molecules take up most of the space. But then say you have these other molecules. In the video it's called urea, but we can also say it's sugar or salt. So you can tell that these molecules aren't going to be able to cross this membrane. So as those molecules kind of float around, what happens is you can see the volume changing. What's happening is because there's a higher concentration on the right of salt, these little green bubbles, so because there's more salt on the right than there is on the left, what happens is to dilute or decrease the concentration of salt over here, we've got to bring water from this side to this side. The only way for water to go from this side to this side is if it actually goes across the membrane. And when water leaves, it's going to decrease the volume. So you can see that here. Obviously, the volume on the right continues to go up. Okay, So that's how you would explain an increase or decrease in the level of water when you have a membrane down the middle and when you put certain molecules, ones that are too big to cross the membrane, like sugar or salt.